Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Including Malachi today, and we're continuing in the give and take form that had characterized the whole book. Very unique to this book, though it's not unique to the, new, to the Bible, for Paul uses the same thing. Notice, your words have been arrogant against me, says the Lord, and yet you say, where have we spoken against thee? Now, this word arrogant is the word harsh. It's a very strong Hebrew word. Now, apparently, these people weren't saying this out loud, but they were kind of whispering it to each other, or they were talking it uh, to a small group, or they were thinking it to themselves. Now, remember, this is not the the pagans, uh, the overtly wicked, this is the, the people who are attending the temple. Uh, this is the priest and the faithful folks who are beginning to say this. Well, it shows the low ebb that has come on the people of God. This was a real period of despondency. Now, look what it says. How have we spoken against you? In verse 16, it says to each other. So obviously it's, it's that group. Now, you have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it if we have kept his charge and that we have walked in mourning before the Lord of hosts? Now, what does this sound like? Well, it's the same old question we dealt with last, last week. Listen, I've been so good. I've kept all the rules. I've done what I was supposed to. Now, why aren't I blessed? Isn't this exactly what Satan said to God? Doesn't Job serve you because of what you give him? Now, I wonder how much of us love God because he's God and how much of us love God because he gives us many things. Well, that was the attitude here. They were seeing the wicked prosper and the righteous just languish, and they were saying, hey, what's in it for me to serve God? Where is the outward proof? Now, we talked about if, if you give with the right motive, God will bless you. And they were saying, all right, I've done everything I know. Where is the blessing? <laughs> you ever feel that way? Well, the problem is their attitude was shot. And, and, and that so often happens. This is what I say. Um, so now we call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of wickedness built up, but they also test God and escape. Now, what was happening here is they had gotten so bitter. This is Psalm 73. This is the book of Job. This is Jeremiah 12, 1 through 4. It's a back of 1, 2 through 4 all over again. They are just got the poor me's. You ever get the poor me's? Here I am so faithful. It's, it's like Elijah. I'm the only one who still loves you. And they're trying to kill me. And God says, hey, fella, I've got 3,000 people in Israel haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Get up. Get out of that mully grubbing attitude. We get there so easy. These poor me's just get all over you. And people of God in Malachi really, really had them. Now, this word test, remember that the same word test is used in verse 15 it's used in verse 10. And the only difference is the motive of the people. Now, I think we can step out in faith and we can stand on the promises of God and God will bless that faith. But if we try to manipulate God, use Him as a puppet on our string, force Him to act, it's a whole different ballgame. I think maybe Judas's problem was he was trying to force Jesus to act. I think sometime modern uh, Pentecostalism tries to force Jesus to act. There's a fine line between proving God and trying to force God to act. And my friends, I'm not always sure which side I'm on. But the attitude and the motive is the key, and who gets the glory is the key. Now, verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. Uh, and gave, uh, and the Lord gave attention and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. Now, I want to know that our faith and love are recorded. I think of that beautiful little verse in the, in the Minor Prophets that says, He keeps a bottle of our tears. I think it's Joel chapter 2. In the Bible, there are two books now, these are metaphors for God's memory. If, if, if we were to say it today, we would say that God has a computer, right? 
One computer is programmed for the deeds of men and one computer is programmed for the names of the righteous. <laughs> in Daniel chapter 7, verse 10, and in Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, these two books are mentioned. Now, the book of deeds, I have always thought, was simply a book of the deeds of evil men. But it is obvious from this verse that that is not true. For the, here God remembers the deeds of the godly. So I'm going to rechange my definition of this and say that the book of remembrances includes the deeds of all men. And for those who know Christ, it's going to be a reward thing. And for those who don't know him, it's going to be a judgment thing. Now, there's another book called the book of life. These two books are mentioned throughout the Bible. I would like to give you a list of these, and you'll see them on your screen, okay? First is the book of life, Exodus 32, 33, Psalm 69, 28, Luke 10, 20, Philippians 4, 3, and I think also Daniel 12, 1. Now, the book of remembrances, both positive and negatively, will be Psalms 56, 8, Psalms 139.16, Isaiah 65.6, and hear this passage, Malachi 3.16. And I hope you'll see uh, what you think as you run these references about the two books of God. Now, notice where it mentions here. And they will be mine, says the Lord of hosts. And the Lord of hosts is that in 55 verses of Malachi, it's used 24 times. It's very, very popular in the post-exilic prophets. Now, it means the captain of the armies of heaven or the leader of an angelic council or the controller of the heavenly bodies, something like that. Uh, in Martin Luther's hymn, Lord Sabbath, his name, well, that means Lord of hosts. That's the word for host. I remember I used to sing and you think he's talking about Lord Sabbath and just couldn't say it right. <laughs> but it's a different word. Now, notice here where it says, They will be gods on the day that I prepare my own possession. Now, this, of course, is speaking of Judgment Day. Judgment Day. Now, what, remember, Judgment Day is for one of two purposes. It's either for salvation and joy and victory, or it's for condemnation and judgment and separation. Now, look at this, if you would, my own possession. This is that unique Hebrew word that in Exodus 19.5 is translated special treasure. You mean we're God's special treasure? Oh, yes. Don't you see the beauty of that here? Uh, we are not our own. We belong to him. And you might want to see Exodus 19.5. It's both corporate and individual. Okay. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Now, back from Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. Here is the metaphor of God as Father. It's in Hosea 11.1 1, so beautifully. Um, I want to tell you, I don't know what you think God is like. Whenever I hit this, my mind just almost explodes to this truth. When you think of God, what do you think of him? Is he a vengeful old man? Is he a tough judge? Is he an angry policeman? Is he a, a, a strict umpire? What is God like to you? For it will color everything in your understanding of God. Oh, I think God really is like a loving father, someone who cares so much for us, wants our best. Now, we'll discipline us, and we'll train us, and uh, we'll speak harshly to us when we get away, and won't let us go too far, but wants our best and cares for us and bids us come to him. Oh, friend, I hope you know him as that loving father. Boy, it is, there's such joy there. There's such excitement there. Uh, boy loving father now notice where he continues when it says let's see kind of lost my place i will find it there it is verse 18 so you will again distinguish this means to return again to between the righteous and the wicked remember the righteous now is that word for a measuring rod god is the standard and all the words for sin are deviations from that standard and we are only righteous as we are in Jesus Christ. There's no other way for us to be righteous. And the wicked between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Now, let me just say to you again, service is not the basis for our relationship, but service is the uh, certainty that we know him. Let me put it this way. 
The road that leads to God is not the roads of man's effort, no matter how good. But the road that leads away from meeting God is certainly a road of good works. Let me put it in New Testament terms of Philippians, excuse me, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. We usually quote 8 and 9 quite often in the evangelical church. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But verse 10 is a really important verse. For we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, that it was foreordained that we should walk in them. Oh, do you mean that, that grace and faith and works go together? Oh, yes. Grace always comes first. It must be followed by faith, and true faith will issue in faithfulness to the will of God and loving one another. Now, I've done several tapes that I'd like to send you. One is grace, what is it? Faith, what is it? Works. Those, those are so important that we see that. I remember for years of my life when I tried to, to earn God's love by doing everything. Oh, I, I would go visiting and I would go witnessing and I would give and I would uh, study and I would on and on. And if I had a good week, boy, I felt loved. And if I had a bad week, I felt rejected. And I remember the day of my life when God broke through the truth to me. Bob, I accept you as fully as I can accept you in my son Jesus. You're not on probation, Bob. I love you. I wanted you to do these appropriate things, but Bob, I love you because of who I am, not because of who you are. Friend, that freed up my life. Now, I still do all the things I used to do, but the motive has changed 180 degrees from serving God to earn His love and keep His love, from serving God because I'm His child and because He loves me and because whether I do it or not, it's going to be okay. It's totally changed my focus. Service is important. Works are not optional. But they always give validity to a previous faith commitment. They are never the basis of a faith commitment. Now, in chapter 4, as you know, that the Masoretic text just continues chapter 3. There's not a fourth chapter in the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text are the group of Hebrew scholars called the Masoretes that worked around the 9th and 10th century A.D. and put vowel points in the consonantal Hebrew text so we would know how to vocalize the ancient Hebrew. It also gave some interpretation by how they accented it and where they put the dividing accent marks. Did you know that the oldest copy that we had of the Old Testament before the Dead Seas was the 9th century A.D.? With the Dead Seas, it took us back to 05, 10, 15 years B.C. And it showed us we had a very good text. It also showed us that the Septuagint family of Old Testament manuscripts was another family of Old Testament. And so it helped a whole lot. But now the Vulgate and the Septuagint have a chapter 3, and the English Bible follows those. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace. Now fire is a symbol of the presence of God and of his activity in our world. Now listen to me again. Remember I said that judgment for some would be a purifying, a burning away of the dross, but for others it would be a fiery ordeal that leads to judgment and eternal fire. You say, oh, I don't like the eternal fire. Well, friends, I don't like it either. But if I accept the New Testament, I don't have an option. In Matthew 25, 46, the same word eternal that applies to heaven is exactly the same Greek word eternal that applies to judgment, separation and eternal fire. Mm. Now, let me give you some references. You all see chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, the refiner's fire, the smelter's fire. And then Psalms 21, 9. Psalms 50, verse 3. Isaiah 10, 17. Isaiah 66, 15 and 16. Daniel 7, 9 and 10. Joel 2, 30. Nahum 1, 5 and 6. 1 Corinthians 3, 13. And 2 Peter 3, 7. Now, I hope you'll look those up, for I think that symbol is a very powerful one. It came into Zoroastrianism, or the Persian faith from Zoroaster, uh, into fire being a symbol of deity. Now, there is no real symbol of deity in Judaism because God does not have a physical body, be it fire or humanoid. But fire is often associated with his coming because he is so radiant, so majestic. It's the Shekinah glory, the, the, the burning cloud 
uh, that symbolize the presence of God. And that, that's the idea here. Okay. And all the arrogant and every evildoer will be like chaff. Now, this is what John the Baptist taught, who I think uh, fulfilled the ministry of Elijah mentioned in this chapter 3 and 4, Matthew 3, 11 and 12. Okay? And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. And this root nor branch is a, another biblical metaphor for total destruction that was used by John the Baptist, Matthew 3.10. We can see it uh, in the Old Testament prophets in Amos 2.9 and Isaiah 11.1. 1. It speaks of, of either the shoot coming off of the stump, but at other times it speaks when the root and the stump are destroyed, there's no possibility of life. So here, a total destruction. Now verse 2. For you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness. Now, King James capitalized the word Son and, of course, makes it a messianic reference, and it very well may be, but it shouldn't be capitalized. You know, there's no capitalization in the Hebrew or Greek text that's inspired. Uh, the form is feminine here and not masculine, which tends to blow that analogy. Now, this Son of Righteousness and with healing in his wings is unique references to the Messiah, I think it obviously refers to that, but we dare not capitalize it here. Now, the, the idea of healing in his wings has been used several times. Uh, possibly refers to the idea of, of healing associated with light. Uh, many times light will help a sore heal. Uh, or possibly it's the Persian symbol of fire. Uh, this is a Persian period. Um, I'm not real sure. And you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. This is a metaphor for freedom and prosperity and health. You ever uh, have to keep your kids in on a, on a rainy day and then the sun comes out and, boy, they want to get out and they just run and leap and jump in all the puddles? Well, that's the idea here. These cows that are let out of the stall and they run skipping across the fields. That's the way God wants us. Uh, sometimes I feel like that we who have grown up with the influence of Puritanism think that what God wants is us to be really serious because you can't really be reverent and holy if you're not serious. What a bunch of pure baloney. Uh, you can't read Deuteronomy without God. He made nature for us. He created our bodies to respond to each other and to nature. He wants us to be abundantly about joy and happiness. He wants us to fulfill the earth and multiply and have good crops and feed our kids and have parties and rejoice and dance and be free. That's what God wants. That's my kind of God. He's not just an old grump up there and says, well, you, you laughed three times today. Boy, you're in bad shape. You need to be a little more serious about this thing. Now, it's serious because it's heaven and hell. But it doesn't mean that God's like that. Friends, I, we, we, we need to capture the joy of this thing again. I think, I think it's got away from us. Skipping like calves from the stall. <laughs> and you will tread down the wicked. Now, this tread down is the idea of a wine press. We get that famous head, uh, uh, you know, uh, the battle hymn of the Republic, God pressing the wine press. It's, the pressure in squashing the grapes, and the grapes, the color of blood, is a, a symbol of pressures that we face. Tread down the wicked, and they shall be ashes on the soles of your feet on that day. Now, this may be back to that Joshua 10, 24 passage we talked about last time, the symbol of a, 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 a person who had been defeated. The, the victor put his foot on that person's neck as a symbol of that, and maybe that's here. Uh, on that day, which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Now, when I get to verses 4, 5, and 6, there's a very interesting thing happens here. In the Masoretic text, it has verse 4, 5, 6, and verse 5 again. In the Septuagint, it has 5, 6, and 4. And you say, well, why would they change it around? Well, <laughs> the rabbis believe that a book should not end except with the covenant name for God. So they sometimes change the verses of these books so that Yahweh... The covenant name for God would be the last name there. They did it to the book of Isaiah, did it to the book of Ecclesiastes, and did it to the book of Malachi. Remember the law of Moses. Now, uh, Malachi is a prophet of his day, and he was telling me he's not a legalist. He's just saying, this is God's will. Walk ye in it. Now, the word remember here is the idea that privilege brings responsibility. My friend, uh, more knowledge of the Bible ought to bring greater Christ-like living. The more we know, the more we're responsible for. People often say, well, I wish I had your Bible knowledge. Sometimes it is such a burden, and sometimes it is such a joy. 
because I feel so responsible for it. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Now, Horeb is the exact same thing as Sinai. Some have postulated that maybe Horeb is the mountain range and Sinai is the individual peak, but we're not sure. But it does refer to that Exodus 19 through 23, where God came down the mountain and wrote with his own finger the Ten Commandments, gave them to Moses for all the people of God. Now, Israel here obviously refers to all the nation. If we'd have been in a different prophet earlier, Israel referred to the northern ten tribes after the kingdom of, uh, of Solomon split uh, between his son uh, Jeroboam and the labor leader Rehoboam. And uh, that was 922, and the northern ten tribes from that day on were called Israel, the southern two Judah. But we're post-exilic now, and Israel refers to all the people of God. Verse 5. Behold, I am going to send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, Elijah did meet with Jesus and Moses at the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, 4. Some of the early church thought that literally Isaiah, excuse me, Elijah would come back before the Messiah came. The rabbis thought that. The Septuagint translates that way. Some of the early church fathers. If you have a book of the Apocrypha, you might be interested to look up a book of Ecclesiastes or the Wisdom of Ben Sirah, chapter 48, verses 10 and following, that talks about the physical return of Elijah. But from Jesus' own words, it seems that John the Baptist fulfilled this role. You might want to see Matthew 11:10 and 14, Matthew 17:12, Mark 9, 11 through 13, and Luke 1, 1, 17. Now, it sounds a little, uh, a little flaky here when you look at John 1, 20 through 25, because the rabbis, I mean, the Pharisees said, now, John the Baptist, are, are you the prophet? Are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? And John said, no, I'm not. But I think they were pressing him to, to try to say, are, are you some supernatural reincarnated figure? Or, 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 and he said, no, I'm a voice crying in the wilderness, like more like Ma- Malachi 3, 1. Uh, and so there's a, some confusion in the New Testament about that. But Jesus' own words confirmed to me when he said, Elijah has already come, and it was John. Okay? So I, I'm not really expecting Elijah back before Jesus returns again. For this is, of course, the Jews only saw one coming. And that has always confused us. The Jews had two ages, the evil age and the age to come. And one breaking in of history. Um, a great and mighty day of the Lord we've been talking about. God would come as a military victor. He would superly, uh, naturally endow a human being and be a military conqueror. No one expected the Messiah to be God incarnate. No one. No one expected the Messiah to come twice. But we learn from further New Testament revelation, he came as Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, uh, Genesis 3:15. Uh, and but when he comes again, oh, friends, the way Jews thought, Jews thought he was coming the first time Woo, he's coming the second time. He's coming king of kings and lord of lords, breaking into history to set up a new kingdom. <laughs> he's coming. Don't give up. Um, and he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children. Now, that's been the emphasis back in chapter 1, didn't it? And it's used in the words of Jesus. So there's a, the real sense of the family unity. Well, that's why I think we call God Father, not because he, Jesus is sexually generated and not because uh, he precedes Jesus in time because of the loving patriarchal relationship in a, in a Jewish home. And that's what it is, I think. Restore the hearts of the fathers of their children, the hearts of the children of their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a... Now, you probably have the word curse. It's the Hebrew word harim. It's sometimes translated under the ban or the korban. It means to give something to God. And that thing becomes so holy and so dedicated, like Jericho, that for man to touch it, becomes profane, and so it must be destroyed because it's so holy. Let me give you a few references. Leviticus 27, 28, and 29, Deuteronomy 13, 16, and 17, Joshua 6, 17, and 1 Samuel 15, 3, and following. Well, we have come to the end of Malachi, and I want to say again, it's an unusual prophet. He's a prophet that's speaking primarily to his day, and yet... There is great hope of the coming Messiah and God putting history right. 
Malachi is written in a day of great discouragement where mediocrity was the norm. People were growing weary of well-doing. Uh, they just didn't see the practical value of serving the Lord. They were growing tired of the ritual and regulation. Now, don't you feel like that sometimes? You get just burned out of the organization and, r- and ritual of serving God. Hey, friend, Malachi is a book to read, not just for the, uh, to get some legalistic rules out, but to catch the flavor of this prophet that says, I am in control, says God. I do know what's happening. It does make a difference how you live, how you do life, how you do faith, how you treat others. It does make a difference. Hang in there. Boy, I think of that uh, passage in the close of Galatians that says, Do not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Oh, Malachi is a book of hang in there. Malachi is a book of keep on trucking. Malachi is a book of watch your attitude. Malachi is a book of if God says do it, do it with a whole heart. Friends, obedience is one sign that you know God. Our lifestyle does not make us Christians, but our lifestyle verifies the fact that we are Christians. The whole book of 1 John, the evidence, and it, the book of 1 John is a book on assurance. More no, you can know than anywhere else. Evidence that we are redeemed comes from the way we live, the attitude behind our actions and our actions give validity and credibility to our initial faith decision. Remember, Christianity is an initial response to God's grace followed by a daily response to God's grace. I've really enjoyed being with you. I hope to see you same time, same place next week. God bless you.